Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Felsed. I'm the editor of Jane's Defence Weekly, and uh, welcome to the World of Defence this month, which is a series of podcasts which we'll be doing over the coming weeks on a variety of topics. Today, we'll be discussing some of the main news stories that Jane's Defence Weekly has been covering. If you want to see those in depth, of course, you can find them on Jane's.com or on the dedicated Jane's Defence Weekly website. We're just going to be talking around some of those subjects. And perhaps the biggest one currently is related to Turkey's acquisition, of the S-400 air defense system from Russia. Now, on 12th of July, Turkey started receiving the first elements of that system. And the reason why this is such a hot potato is that the Americans have said that if they do take this Russian system, then the Turks, as a member of the F-35 program, will actually not be able to continue in that program. The danger to the Americans is that if you have Russian technicians operating their equipment in a NATO country, then it's going to be quite easy for those Russians to calibrate the system and optimise its performance against the F-35, and that will compromise all F-35 users. Now, the the difficulty here is that it's while it seems quite clear to the Pentagon, I'm sure, that these two systems are entirely incompatible strategically, we have President Trump, who at least has an affinity with the Turkish leader, Erdogan, and he is somewhat reticent to act. So what actually happened on the 12th of July, when the news came through that these uh, S-400 elements were starting to arrive in Turkey, There was a briefing scheduled at the Pentagon that was cancelled. That was rescheduled for Monday, which was then cancelled. And we're still looking for some really solid response out of the DoD. JDW Europe editor uh, Nick Forenza, what do you see as being the latest state of play? Have we heard anything from the American side? What what is the latest, at least on the European side? We're actually still uh, writing the story, our colleagues in the States. So they are covering what has happened since Trump's statement yesterday. But there's no news on that front. What is for sure, though, is that the airlift of S-400s from Russia is well underway. Today, the 14th aircraft landed in Murtad uh, Air Base close to um, Ankara. And they've been unloading all kinds of kit. One of my uh, Jane's colleagues has identified at least one uh, transporter erector launcher and there was one very large bit of kit which was covered so we couldn't identify it but it's possible that that it might be a radar but we don't know at this uh, point. The latest I have from our anchor correspondent is that uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has basically said that the first unit of S-400s will be um, installed and uh, ready in April 2020. Now Looking at the Turkish requirement, we we do know that um, they've had this air defence requirement for quite some time. Strangely, President Trump has blamed the Obama administration for for this situation. But of course, the Americans have been trying to sell the the Turks, the Patriot system, for quite some years now. Uh, The Turkish requirement was for what they called their T-Loramids requirement, which was an air and missile defence system. Part of the problem there um, with the Turks is that they required quite a high degree of technology transfer. And this is one of the sticking points, along with price, perhaps, which one of the reasons why the American system, the Patriot system, was not chosen, and one of the reasons why the Turks would have turned to the Russians. So looking at this in the wider strategic fit, it's really quite unfortunate in that Turkey, which used to be a very staunch NATO ally, the real defender of NATO's southern flank, is looking less and less like a staunch NATO ally. Nick, now, what do you think this does to the NATO alliance as a whole? Well, it potentially um, endangers uh, NATO and its uh, entire southeastern uh, flank because it could ultimately lead to Turkey leaving the alliance. Obviously, Russia is, uh, um, President Putin of Russia is is trying to encourage a split. And this is maybe one of the reasons why the airlift has been so visible. I mean, it's a very important symbol. I mean, most of the Missiles are 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 um, apparently going to be um, uh, sea lifted uh, uh, afterwards. But um, having Russian aircraft delivering Russian equipment to a NATO country and a NATO country moving as quickly as possible 
to actually make these uh, operational is not good for NATO. And in fact, I've seen uh, some uh, analysis uh, that this may temper, or maybe the Turks hope it would temper American uh, decision on, on sanctions. The Wall Street Journal ran an editorial yesterday uh, evening where they said something that was quite interesting, though, that the U.S. should maybe not push too hard because Recep Tayyip Erdogan is actually wobbling now. And if another government replaced him at some point in the future, the possibility of Turkey, let's say, returning, becoming closer to NATO again should not be uh, ruled out. Well, as you say, the optics on that do not look good. And, and as we speak, we still await some kind of a definitive response from the American side. Because, of course, we have Turkish F-35s, although they are still currently in the United States. We have Turkish air and ground crew being instructed in the United States. Previously, it was said that those people would continue their courses and would conclude them because they didn't have long to go and there wouldn't be any new staff starting. But um, that was before these F-400 elements started arriving. So we're waiting to hear more from the American side, and I'm sure there will be more on that story. Turning now to our Middle East and Africa editor, Jeremy Binney. Uh, Jeremy, we, we've had some trouble in the Strait of Hormuz recently, haven't we? We've had some tanker troubles. Uh, yes, we have, Pete, yes. So just a, a brief recap. We've had two limpet mine attacks now on tankers uh, on the 12th of May and the 13th of June. Then a US Navy Global Hawk surveillance UAV was shot down on the 20th of June. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the British seized an Iranian tanker off Gibraltar on the 4th of July, and there was an apparently an attempt by the Iranians to counter-seize a British tanker on the night of uh, 10th or 11th of July. So um, uh, it's been a pretty tense situation. And albeit the evidence might not be completely conclusive, I think everyone would pretty much agree that this is an Iranian attempt to put pressure on the US via uh, its allies to a certain extent, especially the ones who uh, who get a lot of that oil from the Gulf, to sort of grant concessions on Trump's maximum pressure policy against Iran at the moment. So it's it, I think it still remains a, a pretty tense situation. So we're just hearing today that the uh, a UAE tanker appears to have gone missing, uh, and the Iranians have got that. It's a bit unclear whether that was seized, as it were, or the Iranians, as they describe it, are helping out a vessel with engine trouble. Meanwhile, the Saudis supposedly have an Iranian tanker that they were helping out that had engine trouble in the in the Red Sea. So, so the tankers are becoming the sort of battleground at the moment for these tensions. Just looking at the British seizure of the tanker, to what extent do we know that that was at the behest of the United States or whether it was simply because it was deemed that that tanker was heading for Syria and therefore sanction busting. Well, I, I think we can speculate a little bit here that there are sort of hints of a at least a bilateral operation here or, or coordination in terms there was a P3, a US P3 was tracked off the west coast of Africa around the time that this tanker would be proceeding up the west coast of Africa in that area. So the Americans probably had eyes on this tanker making sure it was going where they suspected it was going. And the Brits had uh, everything in place and were prepared to board that tanker when it came through the Strait of Gibraltar. Now, the official justification is obviously it's violating EU sanctions rather than US sanctions. And thus, once it's in the uh, uh, UK jurisdiction, which would obviously be disputed in the case of Gibraltar by Spain. But however, it can be pulled over on the, on, on the basis of EU sanctions. Obviously, Iran disputes this. And, and the UK has offered to let it go as long as it doesn't go on to Syria on that basis. But the Iranians don't seem to be very interested in that proposal at this stage. Now, we, we've heard that the, the Royal Navy are increasingly sending more assets into the region. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there's a third ship now dispatched. OK, well, what seems to be happening essentially is uh, HMS Montrose, which uh, protected the tanker um, earlier this month, now, this is a Type 23 Duke class that, that went out via the Pacific and arrived in the Gulf in April. And the whole purpose of this deployment, we were told, was it's going to spend three years or so in the Gulf. And this is going to save on other ships having to sail backwards and forwards to maintain a presence there. However, Montrose has got to go in and have some work. So HMS Duncan, one of the new Type 45s, is, is sailing out there at the moment. And now we're told that HMS Duncan will be replaced later this year by HMS Kent, which is another Duke Type 23 Duke class frigate. Um, so it seems like Montrose 
is going to be out of action for a little while now. And this is why the Royal Navy is basically structuring its deployments to cover the Gulf. But I think it's quite interesting that they're being so sort of open about uh, these deployments to really make it clear that they're going to have a continuous presence of a major surface combatant in the Gulf going forwards for the rest of the year. So that probably reflects that situation where people are going to remain nervous that if Iran doesn't see see any concessions on the sanctions front, then we can pretty much expect more of these kind of attacks. And that situation could potentially escalate if there's a miscalculation. Uh, Yeah, because we've already had Royal Navy guns trained on Iranian fast boats, haven't we? Well, that that was the incident with uh, HMS Montrose. Uh, So uh, uh, supposedly the the Iranian um, fast attack boats were ordering the the tank of British heritage to divert into Iranian waters, but it was uh, being shadowed at that time by Montrose, which then put itself between uh, the tanker and the uh, Iranian attack boats, and and then they withdrew, uh, so the the tanker could then proceed through the Strait of Hormuz. So these are the sort of uh, tactics we're going to probably see emerging if they want to seize tankers, and tankers will need um, escorts, or as the Indians are doing, they are actually putting security teams on board their tankers to uh, protect them. That seems like it's going to remain quite volatile. Uh, Another volatile area we have, of course, is the South China Sea. Now, as we know, China claims large tranches of the South China Sea in its own historical perception of how those waters are owned. They are, of course, disputed by several other countries in the region. But one of the things that China used to say was that they would never militarise any of this. Uh, But of course, they've made these artificial islands uh, and they, there do seem to be increasing signs that they are militarising this area. JDW Asia Pacific editor Gabriel Dominguez, what are we seeing now in the South China Sea? What should we be worrying about? Well, China has continued to improve its military capabilities in the area, not only through the militarization of some of its, of its artificially created islands in the area, but also by improving its naval and aerial capabilities. And it also continues to improve training by conducting what China is already describing as routine military exercises in the area. An event of particular importance uh, took place on 30th June, when uh, the U.S. Uh, news network CNBC reported that China had actually test-fired at least one anti-ship ballistic missile in the South China Sea. Um, at the time, Jane's reached out to the Pentagon and a spokesperson did not confirm that the weapon um, test fired at the time had actually been a ballistic missile. However, they, they did say that a missile had been launched from one of China's man-made structures in the area near the Spratleys. Now, <clears throat> neither Chinese news media nor the Chinese Defense Ministry has officially commented about this missile firing. However, what we do know is that China's Maritime Safety Administration had issued a warning notice the previous day to sailors in the area, um, saying that military exercises would be held in an area some 110 nautical miles north of the Chinese artificial islands uh, at Subi Reef. Now, in the statement that the Pentagon provided to James, the spokesperson said that China's intent was to coerce and intimidate, especially following uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping's statement in 2015 that, uh, as you correctly pointed out, Beijing would not militarize these artificial islands. Now, why is this important? Why should we take a look at this? Well, it is important to know that China has developed both anti-ship ballistic and anti-ship cruise missiles that can be fired from road mobile launchers. And as a matter of fact, in, in May 2018, CNBC had reported that a ground variant of the supersonic YJ-12 um, anti-ship cruise missile had actually been deployed to one of China's artificial islands. Um, moreover, China uh, has uh, actually in service at least two types of anti-ship ballistic missiles. Those are the uh, DF-21D and DF-26 uh, missiles, which have a range of about 1,500 kilometers and 4,000 kilometers, respectively. Now, the Chinese media have already referred to the DF-26 as a highly maneuverable carrier K-2 
killer, which of course would pose a serious threat to any American carer groups uh, navigating in the area. The problem with the story, however, is that there has been no official confirmation from either the Pentagon or China that actually an anti-ship, sorry, an anti-ship ballistic missile has been tested. So until we get further confirmation, it is difficult to say exactly just what China test fired and whether the target was maneuverable or not. So that's that's the latest situation. Now, we can look at this within the context of the US insistence and in fact, uh, US allies, including the United Kingdom, their insistence on conducting freedom of navigation operations in this region to actually keep the seaways open to international shipping. So if the Chinese were in fact deploying anti-ship ballistic and or cruise missiles, that would seem to be a direct threat to those phone ops operations. That is correct. That is one of the, I think, one of the messages that the Chinese might be trying to send uh, Western nations or US allies in the area who try to challenge uh, Chinese claims in the South China Sea. As a matter of fact, the US Navy has been stepping up in recent months the number of uh, phone ops or freedom of navigation operation that it's been conducting not only in the South China Sea, but also around Taiwan, which has angered China. And as a matter of fact, to uh, send another message to the U.S. and its allies in the area, the Chinese have also deployed for the first time ever uh, J-10 multi-role fighter aircraft to Woody Island in the Paracel Islands. Um, I mean, Woody Island, um, we know, has been... Um, a location for uh, J-11 fighters, but it's the first time that we have seen J-10s. And this ap- appears to suggest that the, the Chinese want a permanent or semi-permanent present of fighter aircraft in that area to send, yet again, a message to any not Chinese-friendly foreign power trying to um, get in the area and challenge Chinese claims. That's the situation so far. Sticking with China, we've had a recent uh, declaration from the United States that instead of packaging their their defence equipment sales to Taiwan, this was always a previous policy designed to minimise the extent of diplomatic and geopolitical fallout from China in that they would only have to deal with that situation every once in a while because they'd be just bundling all the things they were going to sell them into one big deal and then just have it out with the Chinese and then things would go back to normal. They've now said that they want to treat Taiwan purely as a normal foreign military sales customer, just like everybody else. Sales go through just like everybody else. And most recently, we've had uh, announced an intended deal for a significant amount of uh, M1 Abrams main battle tanks. So. What what has been the Chinese response to that? Well, the the Chinese reaction, as usual with all these weapon sales announcements to Taiwan, has been immediate. They have actually condemned uh, the announcement and uh, urged strongly Washington to cancel the deal. As a matter of fact, they uh, said that they would even go further and impose sanctions on companies in the United States that are involved in this deal with Taiwan. The Chinese argument is the following. Well, China argues that the move is a serious violation of the one China principle and of the three Sino-U.S. joint communiques that were signed between the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, Just a recap, the one China principle insists that both Taiwan and mainland China are part of one single China. And the joint communiques state that the U.S. would gradually reduce arms sales to Taiwan. So again, the Chinese argument is that these weapon deals with Taiwan are in violation of both of these of these, um, communiques and, and uh, principles. Now, the thing about these, these sales is that U.S. military equipment sales to China have been prohibited since at least uh, the late 1980s, following the incident in Tiananmen Square. Um, but um, the problem is that those Jewish companies could have issues when trying to sell civil and commercial equipment to China. Boeing, for example. Boeing, for instance, although Boeing is not involved directly in this deal, 
But let's take a look, for instance, at, at, at General Dynamics, which is the manufacturer of the tanks. Well, General Dynamics, for instance, produces Gulfstream business jets. Uh, we also have Oshkosh, which uh, produces a range of vehicles and related products for, say, firefighting and construction. And BA Systems is involved in commercial aerospace services and engineering. We also have Raytheon, for instance, which, although it has a limited profile in the commercial domain, especially in China, the company announced in June that it plans to merge with United Technologies Corporation, which in turn has extensive interest in commercial aerospace. So all of these companies might suffer the consequences of the deal if the Chinese decide to go ahead. Let me just remind you, though, that in 2010, the Chinese government had already threatened set to impose sanctions on U.S. companies involved in a previous deal uh, with Taiwan for the sale of Patriot missiles. However, at least it is not known that Beijing ever implemented any related measures at the time. So it remains to be seen whether they will actually go ahead and sanction U.S. companies involved in this latest Taiwan deal. It does seem to be remain to be seen whether just pushing through lower levels of equipment on a regular basis is any better or worse than big packages in, in fewer increments. But we'll wait and see on that one. Now, coming back to the Gulf region, Jeremy, we've seen the Houthis uh, deploy quite uh, a surprising array of what we could call long-range strike weapons in their, their battle against uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and its allies in the region, including some pretty surprising strikes on international airports. So what's going on there? Uh, Where's this all coming from? Um, Yeah, sure. Just as a way of background, around a year ago, uh, the Houthis basically stopped carrying out long-range ballistic missile attacks on Saudi Arabia and uh, started carrying out long-range UAV attacks. So these are UAVs that carry explosive warheads and crash into the targets, uh, whatever you want to call them, kamikaze drones uh, being a popular one. And recently, over the last month or two, we've seen an absolute blizzard of these attacks, uh, short, shorter range attacks on on targets in uh, in the province, Saudi provinces, right next to North Yemen, where the uh, where the Houthis are strong, um, and it's it's been pretty intense campaign of these things. But we've we've also seen the long range attacks last year that were claimed against the. Uh, both Dubai and Abu Dhabi international airports, which are, are probably a, a thousand, maybe twelve hundred kilometers away from uh, Houthi territory, uh, which seemed to stretch at the time. Um, but it turned, and the UAE authorities denied these these happened. But earlier this year, it seems those denials, at least one of them, was very nuanced because footage emerged showing one of these things blowing up over uh, one of the gates at Abu Dhabi international, which is. Uh, which is a little bit scary for those of us who, who use that airport, but yeah. um, uh, so that, so they do have this capability. That's been verified by the uh, UN panel of experts. And finally, last week we got to actually see these. They were unveiled by the uh, the Houthis, and so the um, the Samad three is the long range attack UAV. And it's one of the interesting things about this is that nothing like it has previously been. Um, unveiled by Iran, which we presume is where the technology at least is coming from. So this is this is something that's probably been developed in Iran, but they haven't shown us before. And it's it's really down to their allies to unveil this. It looks a little bit like one that's currently in the Hezbollah Museum of uh, Resistance Against Israel, um, but on a, on a much larger scale and, you know, perhaps adapted somewhat to have a sort of smaller radar cross section. The same is also true for uh, for a new cruise missile. So they claim they attacked Abu uh, International Airport in southwest uh, Saudi Arabia with a, with a cruise missile. They didn't show us what it was. The Saudis confirmed it was a cruise missile. The Saudi military uh, spokesman came out and said it was an Iranian Yar Ali missile, and he, and he identified the engine as a TJ100, which is made by the Czech company PBS, suggesting there's some sort of uh, technology proliferation there. Finally, again, alongside the UAVs, the Houthis show us the cruise missile. It doesn't look like the Yar Ali. Its engine is mounted externally in a, in a sort of like a podded engine rather than internally. The engine does look a bit like a, a TJ100, but it's probably a copy. And I think it's probably good to note here that we contacted PBS that makes yeah. the engine. They say they've never exported to Iran or any of its allies. They, they think it's probably a copy as well. 
So somehow the, they got hold of this engine, which is commonly used for aerial targets and, and reverse engineered it. And this is what they're using it to, uh, to, to power these cruise missiles. So the Saudi military seems to have got their identification a little bit wrong, but maybe this is what the Yar Ali got developed into. And this is the, the, the final derivative of it. But again, it's just showing us really what Iran has probably been developing secretly over these years, but hasn't shown us. We now see it cropping up in Yemen and the, and the uh, Houthis are pretending it's something that they've developed. So Yemen has effectively become a bit of an Iranian battle lab in some respects. I, I, I think so. So I think uh, we've seen that uh, across the region in, uh, in recent years in terms of Iranian weapons being uh, getting combat experience with them, whether it's UAVs in Syria as well, in terms of the Shahid 129, which are the armed UAVs and some of the new longer range ballistic missiles like the Zulfaga being launched from Iran at the Islamic State. So we get a little taste of how effective these, these, these weapons are. The Iranians not doing much testing. So this is actually probably really important experience for them and to actually look how these weapons are performing. But not only that, to look at the countermeasures, what the Saudi air defences are doing to try and shoot these things down and maybe ways that they can adapt their tactics and their technology to overcome the countermeasures. So, so there's, a, there's a really interesting struggle going on there at the moment. Now it's quite convenient for them to allow their proxies to do their testing for them. OK, Nick, we've just got time to cover one more subject. It's just worth mentioning here that on the 16th of July, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the former German defence minister, uh, was voted in as head of the European Commission. She's been quite vocal in the past about, about a European army, would you say? She has uh, used the term uh, before. Uh, how serious she is about that, uh, I'm not sure, but she definitely supports European defence. So what do you think um, the changes will be, if any, uh, if with, with her now as the head of the European Commission? Well, she doesn't really have... Um, decision-making powers, because uh, that's actually the uh, EU countries, uh, which in the mm. council um, make the decisions. But I think she uh, does have the expertise on uh, coming from the Ministry of Defense, and she'll be uh, coming to the uh, commission when it's increasingly getting involved uh, in defense. In fact, it wasn't really involved in defense before, but now it's starting to get very large uh, budgets to fund research and also uh, the development of um, European uh, programs. So, so she'll be um, uh, overseeing uh, that and uh, with um, a supportive attitude, uh, given what she said in the past. Yeah. So in, in terms of uh, European propensity for going its own way on defence, I suppose we've got a couple of drivers there, haven't we? We've got Putin uh, and what's going on with the more belligerent Russia. And at the same time, we've got President Trump being very, make America great again, let's make the Europeans pay. And in fact, somewhat perversely, that has had a positive effect on European spending, hasn't it? Because those two things combined have meant that there is more money available to European militaries for defence and certainly more money available to EU initiatives for defence. Mm. So what, what kind of initiatives do you think you could see coming to the fore? Well, more more generally, um, okay, Putin, I would say that is true. Uh, Putin uh, has been a driver of uh, increased uh, European uh, uh, defense spending. Um, I mean, this increase was occurring before Trump became president, but uh, obviously he's increased the, the pressure. I think what we're going to see is, um, I mean, the European Commission itself is going to be um, supporting some programs at the lowest level all the way up to um, the so-called Euro drone. So this large European unmanned aerial system, which major countries are, are working on. I think also in parallel uh, to that, we're seeing um, different uh, European countries working closer uh, together. Uh, last week, for example, um, there's MRTT, so uh, multi-role tanker transport uh, po a pooling initiative, which um, the unit has now been uh, set up and uh, they will be getting their first jointly funded uh, tanker by uh, uh, funded by four or five uh, different European countries. I and mean, this is one gap which has been identified. I think we'll also be seeing more and more multinational forces or let's say bilateral cooperation also um, in the last week or 
or so, for example, uh, the Belgians and uh, the French who have this um, agreement on uh, cooperating on their um, motorized capability, um, that this agreement has come into effect. The Belgians are going to receive um, vehicles that the French um, Direction Générale de l'Armement has ordered uh, for them. And you're actually going to have, as a result, with the French and the Belgians in a few years, having their uh, infantry battalions using uh, the same um, equipment will virtually be uh, integrated on Belgium and uh, and French uh, units will be able to be plugged into, let's say, the same brigade. So interoperability, really? That's, um, yeah, that's getting more and more uh, interoperable compared to what we've seen in the past. Okay, thank you. We're out of time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this. It's the first in a series. Over the weeks, we hope to have some additional guests specialising in their own areas, talking about various topics. And of course, we'll be back to talk about the most salient stories that we've been covering are on Jane's Events Weekly. And as I've mentioned previously, if you do want to follow up on these stories, you can find praises of the stories on Jane's.com. The stories in their entirety, of course, are on the Jane's Defence Weekly paid for website. Thank you. Bye.